It's our last Friday. Did I hear an O? Oh, thank you for that one O. Oh. Uh, it's okay, I'll take what I can get. Um, it's our last Friday, um, and, uh, and, and so next week is our last week. We have class on Monday, and Wednesday will be the last class. Um, and we've got one more smallish topic to cover after this, uh, which is diffusion. And we'll wrap up on Wednesday. Um, but today, I want to keep talking about polymers. So this is our polymer week. And I want to go back to the properties. I put here the, the properties we've talked about, right? So on Monday, we focused on what a polymer is. And we focused on the ways you make it, right? The, the, the radical initiation, chain addition, and the condensation polymer is, you know, the condensation, right, where you have two different MERS. And then on Wednesday, we talked about things that matter, right? Kind of like engineering polymers. Like, what are the properties of, of the polymers that, that you can change, that we can change, right? And so we talked about, you, well, you can pick a different monomer. That will change the properties, right? Uh, we've been through that. Uh, you could try to grow longer or shorter strands, right? So that, that, that's going to change properties. Uh, the interactions between the strands which will, of course, depend on, on what you pick there. Right? Uh, and then we talked about uh, the density and the crystallinity and how that could depend on things like cooling rate right? Uh, or maybe the physical structure itself of the chain. So what do I mean by that? Well, I mean, when I say physical structure, of course, I mean the chemistry that makes that physical structure. So I could branch the chain with the same monomers, but now instead of being one linear chain, it's a bunch of branches. Uh, or maybe you could, you could have a, a functional group that you can control which side of the chain it's on. And all those things would lead to differences in density and crystallinity. And then the last thing we talked about is cross-linking. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to add one more thing to this list today. Um, uh, but before I do that, I want to pick up on the last slide of Wednesday, which is this. I sh so, so we tend, so all this kind of goes in together to give you these solids called polymers, right? Yeah, but we, we talked about how they're, they're also, you know, sometimes they're not fully solid. And that's what's going to come in the middle. But you can make a solid thermoplastic, which is these strands, right? So what is a thermal, huh, what's up? Anyway, so a thermoplastic, we'll look over here. There's no cross-linking. So you don't have any of this. But what do I have? Well, I have these really long strands that are, that are bonded together with these IMFs. Typically, in a thermal uh, plastic, you would have something like maybe Van der Waals, right? And maybe you have some H bonds. And these materials, uh, because you didn't cross-link them, and, and you didn't cross-link them strongly, right, with some kind of strong bond, because of that, um, you can reheat them and reprocess them. So these are actually... Uh, often the plastics that we recycle, that we can recycle. Um, and like I said, they're mostly linear and maybe slightly branched polymers. Right? You know, and uh, they're used in a whole lot of applications. So we call them thermal plastics. Thermal, you can heat them, right? You can heat them. And you can see what happens is if, if I heat these back up, right, the, these links can start moving. They wiggle. And they wiggle and they wiggle until they can just kind of slide past each other, right? And, and become a viscous uh, liquid and then a melt. On the, on the other hand, if I've got a thermal set, thermal, I heated it up, and, and then I, as it set, I cross-linked it. And, and there are lots of ways you can cross-link. We talked about some of those, right? Uh, and now I've got a pretty high density of cross-links, so that's drawn here. So I've got these long strands. Remember, they're super, super long, right? And, but now, every so often, uh, I, I have something linking them together. And if I put a lot of crosslinks in, and if they're strong crosslinks, then you can get really hard plastics, right? And, and so these are high, the thermal set, they're set. They're set. <laughs> it's thermal set. Good. It solidifies when, and it can't be reheated. Why? Think about it. If I heat that up, right, then, OK, I might melt the polymer so the chains are kind of wiggling around, but those, those cross-links aren't 
going anywhere. They're really strong, right? And so what happens with thermosets is they're very difficult to recycle. They're very difficult to recycle because what will happen is before those things melt, the whole thing catches fire. The whole thing catches fire. It burns often. Right? Or, or maybe it doesn't burn, but when you melt it, you got this weird chemistry now of, of the crosslinker mixed in to the polymer, and it's not useful anymore. So these kinds of plastic, uh, the crosslinking is really great. You make, you know, like I said, over 30% of all toys. Um, it's used in many, many, many applications, these harder plastics, um, but they're not recyclable. Okay. And then we talked about this intermediate region. And this is where we ended. We talked about elastomers. And elastomers are in between. Right? And so in an elastomer, you've got light crosslinking. And the crosslinking, like in slime, that crosslinking has uh, a, a, a weaker hydrogen bond, right? And remember, we talked about how that could lead to like viscoelasticity, really cool stuff. Um, in the, you know, in, in other cases, right? Like in the case of the the vulcanized rubber, remember that Charles Goodyear, that story from Wednesday. In that case, you put a covalent bond of sulfur between the strands, right? And, and that gave you a much stronger rubber that still had some elasticity, right? Um, but now, the, the best analogy here is still the spaghetti. I keep coming back to it. I'm not letting go. Think about it. If I've got a bowl of spaghetti and I pull on it, that's my plastic bag on the left, right? That's my plastic bag. I pull on it, and those, those chains are all crumpled up and tangled, and I'm untangling them. And then I'm sliding them past each other and pulling it until the whole thing rips. That's the bowl of spaghetti. But now I've got this spaghetti that attaches every so often one strand to another. Think about it. I've got a bowl of spaghetti, but in each strand of spaghetti, there's like five places where it's attached to another strand of spaghetti. Now what happens? I can pull that as well. Right? I can pull it because those spaghettis are all curled up. And so there's some, there's some amount of pulling that I can do while they uncurl until those links take over and I can't pull past them, right? That's what the, cross, the light cross-linking will do. And you say, well, if I had heavy cross-linking in the spaghetti, then the whole bowl of spaghetti wouldn't be very easy to move because I'm always up against all the links between them, right? And, and so that's why these elastomers are so interesting because they fall, well, they're, it's all interesting, but the elastomers fall in between where there's some of that uncurling of the polymers until you get to a point where depending on how much you crosslink and the bonding of the crosslink, you're gonna go up against the crosslinking, right? And, and so these are used so they're free to move. Um, now, must be above its glass transition temperature. I wanna talk about that for a second. So I did mention this, I wanna be sure that we all have a good sense of what that means. And so I wanted to, you know, taking this, uh, this elastomer, say what happens when you melt it, right? And we drew this curve, but I want to go very carefully. This is the temperature. Oh, we love this curve, the molar volume, right? And now up here, you've got your liquid, right? We know that. And then here is the place where it would crystallize. Can a polymer crystallize? Sure, right? If a polymer crystallized, then it would just be these strands in a crystal. What is a crystal? We know it's, it's a repeating ordered structure. Yes, polymers can crystallize. But as we've talked about so often, what happens is you, because like, you know, like we talked about with silica, they, you know, you got this very viscous amorphous, you can't find the crystal sites, same with polymers, and so you get a glass. And then this was the TG. Now, why am I showing this? Because with these strands, I want to show you, you know, we've drawn this before, where, I, you know, often what you get in polymers is some degree, it's right here, some degree of crystallinity, right? So, so what do I do? How do I do this? Well, you've got, you literally have both, right? You so I've drawn this already, right? So if I'm here in, on my polymer, 
then it might look like what I've drawn already on the board. Oh, I love doing this. And then there's the crystal, and then there's more. I've drawn this already, right? You've got like this crystalline region, so we've got the crystal. And here, because I'm below the glass transition temperature, this part here is an amorphous, oh boy, it's kind of small, but this word says amorphous, solid. It's a solid. That part is a solid because it's below the glass transition temperature, right? Okay, but now let's start heating this up. And as I get to the glass, so now I'm going to get here. And what happens is it doesn't actually go straight to the, the full liquid. I mean, it, 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 it's got this crystalline stuff in there, right? It's got these regions. This crystal has one melting point. Remember, the melting point of the crystal is the melting point of the crystal. <laughs> it doesn't change. Last transition temperature can be, can be tuned. But this is the melting point. Now, so what, what happens? Well, what happens is there's more of like a curviness to this. And you might kind of have the shape look more like this. So what's happening? This, this just gets a little bit more at the detail of how a polymer would melt if it's got any crystalline regions. And as I've told you, very often it does. Not always. It could have no crystalline regions. It could be totally amorphous. But I've drawn this enough that I wanted to explain this curve with that as our starting point. Right? And I've also talked about how the degree of crystallinity is so important for properties. And it can be controlled. So what's happening? Well, in this region here, let's draw that picture. So now I'm in here. And what happens is I'm below Tm, but I'm above Tg. So that means that literally in the same strand, this is so cool. I, <laughs> that looks the same. It's not supposed to be the same. Because now this is a liquid. This is a viscous liquid. And this is still a crystal. That's an extal. I'm below Tm. So the crystalline region has not melted, but the rest of the polymer is above its glass transition. This is so cool. This one strand is both a solid and a liquid. One strand. That's so cool. That's in here. Right? And then I get over here, and now here, OK, well, let's see. So now this is all liquid, and the crystalline part is starting to come apart. So crystal melts. Extal melts. Right? Well, that sort of was supposed to be the remnants of a crystal in there. <laughs> and then above TM, the whole thing's a liquid. Right? So that's kind of zooming in. I wanted to make sure that we understood this plot in the context of these polymers. And, and that also gives you a sense. Now, OK, now that's this one strand. Now I've got a bunch of strands. Did I connect them or not? And that adds the layer of what an elastomer is. right? Because now you can imagine, is, it, is the elastomer above or below TG? Where is TG? Are we above or below TG when we bounce a ball? Right? How does that influence the properties of the ball? The, the, the ball, a rubber ball is lightly cross-linked. Right? And, and you can imagine that if you're below TG, then well, all that, all that amorphous part of the ball is, is, uh, is a solid. So there's an elastic response. Sure, it could still bounce. I mean, if, if you're in this region, then that, then that part of the ball is a liquid, but it's lightly crosslinked, so the ball doesn't fall apart, right? So it's going to bounce differently, right? It's going to bounce differently. OK, so anyway, I wanted to just go into detail of that to make sure that we feel our oneness. And, and I mean, you could add here, this is, this is a, you know, because it's so important in just, as I was saying, like just in terms of what this material, how this material behaves, you could add the glass transition temperature, which, as we've already talked about, has a number of ways that it can be tuned. Uh, on the other hand, it may also be tuned by some of these other things that you do. But it's a very important part of the polymer property ecosystem. OK, good. 
So that's the elastomer. That's the elastomer. Now there's one more thing that we can do that I wanted to talk about. Oh, that's the picture. Yeah, I thought I'd show you another picture. So I'm not the only one that, that draws things like this. <laughs> right? OK, there's a nice one from Encyclopedia Britannica. And you can imagine this region being a solid down here, then a liquid, but that's still solid. And then that, that region melts all at once at TN. The last thing that I want to add is, is another way that we have to control polymer properties. And, and it's, uh, it's another bullet here. And it'll be our last one. And it's, it's really the composition and sequence. So what do I mean by that? Well, it turns out that, you know, remember when we did uh, condensation, right, polymerization, right? A polycondensation is called the condensation polymerization. We had two different MERS. Um, and, and we could have picked the box. Remember, the box inside the MER could be different things. Um, and then when we've done the radical initiation, we've just had one MER with a double bond. right? Now, if you have one MER, then that's called a homopolymer. Um, and if you homopoly, and if you have two, it's called a copolymer. And the thing is that we actually can even con we can make copolymers with both approaches. And not only that, but we're learning more and more how to control the sequence. And that's what this shows here. Right? So I could have a polymer A. You know, let's say I have a, uh, yeah, I'll put it below this. Let's say I have a, a you know, polymer polyethylene, PE, which is, oh, we know now how to draw these, C, C, Mm. N. And then I've got the other one, which is PVC polyvinyl chloride. And that looks like this. See, all I've done here is swap out a hydrogen for a chlorine, and I've got a totally different polymer, right? Some other N, OK? And uh, N and M, whatever. I can now alternate these. I can alternate them. And I could alternate them in this way. So PE might be my A, and PVC might be my B. And if I alternate them, we might, you know, if it's like regular alternating, we might write PE, this is how we'd write the copolymer, A, PVC. All right, but you could also have it be random. So then you'd write PE, you can take a guess, R, PVC. All right? Uh, you could write a grafted version, PE, G, well, you get the point, PVC, and so forth. What I mean when I write this, is that I've taken these two polymers and I've copolymerized. I mean, sorry, these two, well, yeah, these are the polymers. The mon I've taken the monomers and I've made one polymer out of the two of them, but I've controlled the sequence. It's not, now, maybe it's not controlled. Maybe it's random, right there. Or maybe I figured out how to do this in a way that I, that I have the backbone, all one type, but I can have these side chains, the branches, another type. That's really powerful, it turns out. Or maybe you can control that I have a certain number of them and then a certain number of the other. And this is called a block copolymer. A block copolymer. Some of you may have heard of block copolymer chemistry, which is growing, is a very growing, very powerful field. Because when you make these blocks and you control their properties, you can imagine that you control all sorts of things about how that polymer behaves. Imagine, you make A something that bonds to A, but not B. Like dissolves like, right? We've been there. B is something that bonds to B, but not A. OK, what's going to happen? They're stuck. But they're going to try to come together and stay apart in the same strand. All sorts of interesting things can happen and can be engineered when you can control these blocks or these graphs, right? So that's the last thing that we, now here's an example. This is, uh, uh, I was trying to look for a good example. Here's um, something called, actually, what is it called? Serlin. How did you come up with that? I don't know why that's the name, but that's the name. It's the Serlin resin, which is the, the, the ingredient that goes into the polymer, OK? And, um, and look at what it does. Oh, it provides clarity, toughness, 
Versatility, it's, Serlin is a leading choice for food, cosmetic, medical device, skin, st stretch, packaging, as well as golf balls. <laughs> the tunability is enormous. Why, what is Serlin? Well, you, we don't know exactly because they won't tell us, but Serlin is actually, it's really cool. It's, it's using, okay, it's using, uh, where, da, where did I put it? Composition, sequence. It's using sequence to make a graft polymer where you know, one type is, is, is going along the chain and the other type is coming out. But really importantly, the other type is made specifically to form ionic bonds. So here, B is made so that it can form ionic bonds with other parts. Ionic, remember, that, that's basically by grafting Right? By creating a copolymer where one type wants to form ionic bonds, I've crosslinked, I've made a crosslink built into the polymer itself. The crosslink is going to be linking the strands together, maybe within itself, maybe with other strands, but with an ionic bond. Right? But I've done it all without having, I've done it all just built into the polymer. And that's why you can see here, look at this, it's an ethylene copolymer. Right? So ethylene is the backbone, the co is what's coming out of the side, and that's an ionic bond, so it's also called an ionomer. What's an ionomer? A polymer that has ionic crosslinks, ionic bonding crosslinks. And what's cool about that? Well, you get the whole world of ionic bonding now in the mix. Right? And, and, so, and so what does that mean? Well, you could have it be very strong, golf ball. You can have it be thermally responsive. Right? You can tune at what temperature these bonds break. There's all sorts of flexibility. And you can see it right here in how they're marketing it. You know? Can do almost anything. Another um, example of the copolymer, I'll give you a couple examples of copolymers. This is one that, um, uh, that, uh, that you may have uh, seen. Uh, maybe many of you experienced, you just don't remember. This is the diaper, right? And, and so, so, what, um, so what a diaper is, is it's got this, this copolymer made out of acrylic acid. These are the monomers, right? Notice the double bonds. Oh, we're going to take advantage of those, right? And we're going to make a polymer, and we're, but we're going to do it in a controllable way. So we're going to take these two mers and we're going to control how they come together. And very importantly, in these kinds of materials, they're broadly uh, uh, called, you can call them hydrogels, right? These are materials that can absorb hundreds of times by weight, hundreds of times water into them. Why? Because in one of the copolymers, in one of them, you've got this sodium atom. And what happens is there's the dry state. It's all curled up, and, and, and the chains want to be all together. But as soon as you introduce water, those sodiums like going into the water. And what happens? They leave behind this oxygen that really wants the water, <laughs> right? Because it's a negative charge. And, and so, so you get a sodium ion going in solution. You get the solution coming to the anion. And even more than that, now if the sodium leaves, then what happens? Well, what happens is all those negative charges are left, and they repel each other. That's going to help this whole thing want to expand, right? So, the, so that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a diaper, 2% right? of all landfill, by the way. Now, um, so that's another example of a copolymer uh, and a really interesting way of tuning the properties. And here you know, has to do with, you know, what, what did we do? We tuned the ionic character of the backbone. We tuned the charge, right? We made it responsive in terms of its charge to something. In this case, water, the presence of water. That's cool. OK, last one. And, and here I want to talk about mechanical strength. So this is, uh, 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 this is the, the tensile strength. So how far could you pull this thing, right, this material, um, before it breaks? And then here's the elongation right, until it breaks. So it gives you some. Now the tensile strength, this is how far can you pull it in the elastic regime? You can see that for steel, it's really high. But you can't pull it very far before it breaks. We know that, right? So steel's really strong. 
but it's not very flexible. There's nylon. We did nylon. So it's, it's kind of not nearly as strong, but it, it has a lot of elongation. Here's fiberglass. This is plastic reinforced glass, right? Um, where you can get a lot of strength, very little flexibility, more than steel, a little bit more than steel. Well, actually, it was a lot more, but still, it's only 3 or 4% uh, elongation. And here's a, a cellophane that's a naturally, can be a naturally occurring um, uh, polymer. Uh, you can also make it synthetically in the, in the mix. And I want to point out nitrile. Nitrile rubber is a really interesting copolymer. And, and many of you may have seen, or you, if you're in a lab, you might use nitrile rubber gloves. You might uh, have them at home at the sink. Um, and one of the advantages of nitrile rubber is, again, this enormous tunability by just picking how you copolymerized. How much of one did you put in the other? And, and this is, uh, you know, it, maybe I'll use this board here because it's a really cool copolymer where you're putting in acrylonitrile. So here's what this looks like. So you put your CH2, your CH, your double bond, your CH, your CH2, and there it is. And that's going to repeat some number of units that you control because it's a, it's a block copolymer. Before you put this one in, and here's the kick, it's got a triple bond nitrogen on it. And that's going to go a certain M. Right? Now, that, that comes from acrylonitrile and butadiene, but again, it's the synthesis to make the copolymer. It's the sequence. Uh, I keep on forgetting where. It's up there. It's the composition, the architecture. Right? How did I put those copolymer? If you do this in the right way, it's the amount of the acrylonitrile that you put in will control the strength. It'll make it stronger and stronger and stronger. Because you got, a, you got this really nice, strong bond in here, and this will give the material a lot of strength. So that's why you can go up to you know, fairly reasonable. But then how much of this I put in is going to determine how far you can stretch it. And so you balance those. And you can make a whole bunch of kinds of nitrile rubber. OK. So I hope this is giving you some, some examples of the tunability of polymers. And you know, if you take the bigger picture, and this is a little hard to read, it's in, you know, it'll be on the slide, so you could look up this paper here. It was published in Science a few years ago. And you look at the fracture toughness with the yield strength. Right? So what is that? Well, yield strength is, remember, you know, we know that because it's when you, you're in the elastic region and you're pulling, and then you yield to plastic deformation. Right? That's the yield strength, that yield point. But what about fracture toughness? Well, that's if you start a crack, does the thing tend to crack more or not? That's the fracture toughness, basically, right? And so you can put materials down on this ply. You got ceramics, you got concrete down here, you got, right? So, um, so you're not going to be, so, so the polymers sit here, right? Here's uh, metals and alloys, metallic glasses. You can, you can look at this on your own and look at each one of those. But I just want to point out, polymers have a fairly wide range, but there's so much interest in going beyond. I mean, there's a lot of interest in, in, in using polymers in many other applications. We can't get there yet because we can't push it out here, right? Or maybe out here, right? We still need to figure out how to tune it more. We got all these ways to control the properties, and we're still only at the very beginning of understanding how to engineer polymers. Now, there is no better way to make that point clear than to look at nature. Right? And, and I, I already showed you the tree and, and the, the, you know, the, the, the examples of nature as a polymer engineer. I want to talk about that a little more. And because nature is nature's not just a polymer engineer. Nature, I'm going to write this down. Nature is a polymer engineer gone wild. And I'll show you why. Polymer engineer. Humans, what can humans do? I mean, well, we are a natural polymer engineer, engineer material, but what can we make with all of what I've just shown you? What can we make? I can put like one or maybe two, or if you really go into the research, you get three MERS controlling, trying to control where they are in the chain, 
right? You got three, maybe two, we really two most materials. Coal polymer, we're so proud of this nitrile. Coal, two MERS, and we control them, and we make rubber sheets, right? But nature, but then they're everywhere. They're everywhere is just that, right? So nature can have, so humans have the same, same functional, functional group every stop, all right? Okay, that's like one mer. Maybe I've got two, maybe two or three. Nature can have different, different groups, and here's the key. It can have them everywhere. Okay, so what I have is I have many, many, many more possibilities. But, I mean, we have these possibilities too, we just can't control it, right? So, so if I look at, like, let's go back to condensation, polymerization, because this is what nature does, right? So this was what I drew for you on, on Monday. There's a dicarboxylic acid. Right here, we're making nylon and a diamine, and we're making polyamide. And remember, the box in nylon 6.6, six, the box is six carbon atoms. I call that boring. <laughs> What's it? Six carbon atoms, some hydrogen. But that's kind of boring. But in nature, this box is an amino acid. That's much more interesting. That's much more interesting. Because if you look at an amino acid, and this is an amino acid, why is it an amino acid? Well, it's got an amine group here and a carboxylic acid there, so it's an amino acid. But see, here's the thing. R, this is nature's, this is nature's, the box. We can put six carbons in, we're really proud of ourselves. Nature can put almost anything it wants for R, right? So R, just to spell this out, right, so R, is nature's choice. And I'll show you what it chooses, nature's choice. Because there are hundreds of amino acids, um, and, and the, this R group can do many things, um, and, but you know, just 20 is all we need to make protein. Right? Most proteins are made out of just essentially 20. But if you do the math, I think I have the math here. And you take, let's see, okay, if I take two amino acids, let's say I take two amino acids, so I've got two different R's, two amino acids, and I've got a length is two, and this is called the dipeptide. I'll tell you why in a sec. Okay, but let's compare this now. Now I've got 20 amino acids, and I just told you that 20 is what nature makes most proteins out of. 20 different R's. 20 different, there's an amino acid, R is nature's choice. But see, if I've got 20, then I've got 20 squared equals 400 dipeptides. I've made a two unit polymer. It's not a polymer, it's a peptide. Yeah, but now what if I take the 20 and I've got, but now I've got, let's say, 1,000 units long, 1,000 units long, then I would have 20 to the 1,000 possibilities, which is 10 to the 1,300 combinations. So. 10 to the 1300 possibilities. That's because there's a thousand units and I've got 20 amino acids, right? It's just, but now you think, how do you, how do you possibly think about what to do? That is nature. It's had a billion years and it's given us the world that we live in, that we know. It's, 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 it's messed with these combinations in a way that's impossible for us to even understand. That's why I say nature is a polymer engineer gone wild. It's got 
almost limitless flexibility, and it's used it. Right? Now, how does, it, how does nature make its polymer? Well, it's condensation polymerization. This is, the, this, is the, this is just what we saw. Look at that. That's why you have, this is what an amino acid is. It's got this carboxylic, so th there's the OH group that can condense with the H here and form the link. There it is. That's called a peptide bond. With two amino acids come together, that's a CN, that's a peptide bond, right? Oh, but look, this had R1, that had R2, right? And, and I've got 20 different acids, uh, uh, amino acids to choose from. The possibilities are endless. So the protein synthesis is, uh, protein synthesis is condensation. You knew that. You knew it couldn't be anything else because there's no double bond. Where would I have done a radical initiation with these amino acids? If I'm nature, I, I got to make it with condensation uh, polymerization. That's how we are made. OK. Now, so it, you know, just to give you a sense, so the R, I'm not going to go through this, obviously. I'm just giving this to you as if you want to read more about it. There's some wonderful charts. Here are 20 amino acids, the 20 that are most common, and that nature puts together. And what they've done that's really nice here is they've grouped them, right? Because what did nature choose to do? How is it most? utilizing the properties, the tunability in these amino acids. I said there were 20, but most proteins are, I said there are hundreds, but most proteins are made from these 20. It gives you the, the tunability in having maybe nonpolar groups, right? Uh, so it might be then hydrophobic, polar groups, hydrophilic. Uh, maybe you can, you can put, you, the nature can put R groups in there that, have, that maybe have a charge or that lose or, or take an ion. Right? So you can, it, can, it can play with the charge, and it has done all of that. It can have groups that become acids, that make something acidic, and so forth. OK, so that's cool. What has nature done? Well, I, I, I got to show you the spider. Because, um, and if you're interested, Professor Bueller does some wonderful work on spider silk. Because I think this is a, a great example of something that nature can do that, that gives us a sense of how far away we are. Like I said, we're very proud of this, and we want to do more, right? And so we take our two MERS, and we mix them together, and we make branches. Maybe we're going to try to add a third. Meanwhile, nature has had a lot more flexibility and a lot more time. What can it do? Well, here's spider silk. Now, this is a spider. Spider is, is an incredible polymer synthesis machine. It's an incredible polymer synthesis machine. And here it is weaving a web. And I love this because I think it's so cool. OK, there's music, I guess. I forgot about that. <laughs> and there it is. Now watch. Out of here, this is the, this is the front, back of the spider. There's a, there's, there it is, right there. It's making protein. That's called spider silk, right? But it, these are proteins. These are polymers. It is doing condensation polymerization right there. And, and then there's all sorts of structural stuff that it does, right? It's got a specialized hook. It knows how to step. It creates, look at that. There's a branch place where it knows to put it, right? It's already created the glue. Um, but it, and so it, not only is it putting this spider silk out there, but it can put other types of polymer, depending on what it needs. Does it need something really sticky, less sticky, right? And so there it is weaving its web, and it's generating this polymer on the fly, right? It's doing condensation polymerization. Now, a couple properties about spider silk, OK? So here we go. Let's see. So spider silk, this is, this is just one example of what nature can do. It's five times stronger than steel. Remember the chart, mechanical strength chart, nothing, nothing was stronger than steel. Spider silk is five times stronger. Just to give you a sense, the, the example I, I found that I like, if, if, um, if you had a spider silk that was a pencil width and you made a strand, it would stop a Boeing 747 in midair. That's how strong it is. Um, it, oh, it keeps, um, keeps strengths. Here's another thing. Keeps strength below. 40 degrees C. We can't do that. <laughs> Just take a, take a rubber ball and, and put it at that low of a temperature and try to bounce it. It's going to shatter. 
right? No, nope. spider silk can keep that strength and not break. Um, it's elastic, so it's got, um, throughout all of this, it's got an elastic property of 4x, so it can be stretched to four times its original strength, right? Okay, compare that with nitrile. Nitrile rubber could also go to very, very high uh, elastic you know, elongation, right? So if you go back to nitrile, right, here it is in the table, we're very happy with this. But this only had two monomers to play with, right? We played with two monomers and we got to here and look at the sacrifice in the strength. Look at how much we had to sacrifice strength. Spiders don't have to do that. Here's the last one. Fully recycles. Now, the thing is that this is actually kind of incredible, right? Spider webs get dusty. Spider webs get dusty. They lose their stickiness. So many spiders know this and just simply have to weave a new web every day. But they don't leave the old web there. They actually eat it. And they fully recycle it, fully, right? They eat the web, fully recycle it, process it, have this condensation polymerization work, and make a new one the next day, right? So we don't come close to this spider. We don't even come anywhere near it, right? in terms of where we are. Even though I gave you all of these wonderful things that we're doing with engineering, we still have so far that we could go if we could just figure out how nature works. OK. And this gets me to what we do. And so, so I've got my why this matters now. And um, so a spider eats its web, fully recycles it, spins a new web the next day. Here's what we do with our, uh, our, our polymers. Um, I already talked about the oceans. Um, here's what we do on land. This is a tire. These are tires. And tires are very difficult to recycle. Why? Because you've, they're, they're too vulcanized. They've got too much crosslink. Remember, if the crosslink density is too strong, which you need to make a tire, then, um, uh, then you can't recycle it. And in fact, what happens is, and, and here's a, there's a tire mound. Here's a, here it is from a satellite picture. Those are tires. Those are tire mounds. Here's what happens when one catches fire. Here's what happens when many catch fire. Right? Um, it's actually a very hard fire to control once they catch. Um, and, but we don't, we don't really know how to recycle them well yet. What can we do? On the science and engineering side, the, you know, the fact of the matter is that there's a lot of work to do, but there are promising directions. So I wanted to leave you with a little bit of that. And, and I'm not going to go into great detail. I just want to show you, and there's references here you can look at. This was published a couple of years ago in Nature. One direction is in, is in self-healing polymers. This is a very exciting direction. What can we do? Well, we, can, we can go away from this whole single-use idea and make stuff last longer. Right? So that would be beneficial. Maybe not if it winds up in the ocean. But in terms of just how, how long we can use these materials, um, so one direction is, well, you got these, these polymer networks, and you incorporate little gels, little beads in here. But the beads don't open up until a crack comes along. So they're sensitive to a crack. And when they feel a crack in the material, they open up. And they pour a healing liquid that then solidifies. That's a self-healing kind of approach. You can do that at different scales, all the way down to the strand. You can do that at larger scales. And here's a whole system where there's actually this healing material being float, flowed through a polymer structure, just like arteries in our body. Again, always there to try to heal the material. Right? Another direction is in fully recovering. And, and again, I don't want to go into full detail here. You can look up some of this stuff that this was published last year. Can we take the polymer and chemically decompose it all the way back to the monomer? Can we go back to where we started? Can we do what the spider does? Right? The answer is no, not today. But if we could, that would open up a whole lot of doors for recycling that are closed today. Can we do this in a way that is efficient? Right? And, and then the, another direction of work that I think is very important is in making thermosets, 
so heavily cross-linked, so you get all the hardness and all the properties you need of the polymer that's heavily cross-linked, but easily breakable in the cross-link. And there is good work going on in this direction. Can we make degradable thermosets? That's another really important direction. And last, we should be encouraging people, if you can't do any of this, at least take the polymer out of the landfill and make something with it. And there are projects, you can look at here, Waste Management uh, Journal, in, in making bricks out of polymers, incorporating them into construction materials. Right? These are important directions, and we need a lot more, um, hopefully, in the very near term. No more just talking about alignment. OK, have a good weekend.